Imagine if you could have your off-grid home built in a weekend. That's one of the biggest pros of living in a yurt, the fact that you can build it so fast. But nothing is perfect. So in today's episode, we are going to dive into the subject of yurts. We have Paul from Nomad Shelter. I'm happy to, happy to dig into it. I, I know uh, more about yurts than I thought I ever would. So. <laughs> He's gonna help us learn what the pros are to the yurt, what the cons are to the yurt. During the cons section, we do cover bears. So stay tuned for that. Is the yurt right for you? We're gonna help you answer that question. Life in the round. Probably the biggest pro of the yurt, how much money you can save building a yurt compared to a traditional home. The amount of home that you get for the material and the cost input that you have to spend, you're doing it for just dollars per square foot. It's significantly less expensive than a modern stick frame home. You know, you're, you're skipping a lot of difficult technical steps that require a lot of tools, um, usually professional labor in more remote places, which is where yurts generally end up, not the middle of a city. When you hire a construction crew, you know, you're paying top dollar for someone and you start penciling out what a nice structure a yurt can be versus the cost input. And boy, it, it, it's really night and day for a lot of folks. You, you get a great structure. I think another really great pro, and this is maintenance. In tough conditions where you're getting a lot of snow over the winter and and gutters that are, want to rip off your house and, um, you know, roofs that need to be replaced, they're rusting out. And the list is actually surprisingly long. You, you don't think about it when you purchase or build a regular stick frame house, especially because when you do it, it's brand new. But over the years, that modern style of construction, it gives you a building that degrades constantly. The beauty of the yurt is the outer structure of it is very simple. There's no eaves, there's no gutters necessarily. Very little exterior maintenance to keep up with. A yurt will generally take care of itself year after year. You free up all that additional input of time and money that, that you're, you normally would have to put into a house. That again, continues to save you down the road and, and let you live um, a life or built around yourself, not just constantly pouring your energy into into a structure. Now you mentioned this, I, I consider this to be a big pro of the year, and I know it depends on what you're doing and the kind of build, but the element of portability, how much more portable than your typical home can a yurt be? Quite portable. It is a structure that can be taken back down, you know, without damage uh, and set back up again. You can actually take it back down, carry the components, which are, you know, carried by hand. You could carry it through the forest up a trail if you wanted to, and then set it back up in yeah. another spot. It, it is a matter of scale, of course. If you've got a 40-foot yurt, that's just physically a bigger structure to move. There, we, have, we have a lot of people who will plan on living on the yurt for three or four years and then want to build a bigger structure after they've had time to save up their money because they're no longer wasting everything on rent. And then they plan on building a bigger house. And they can put the yurt where they want with the nice view and then go ahead and move it three or four years down the road off to the side. So that's that's the thing that you can do with um, with a yurt. Yeah, and that's so unique, that ability to be able to do that, unless you build a tiny house on wheels. You know, there is the side benefit that, you know, you're being portable. If you're in a position where things in the end didn't work out, of course, you can take it back down. Right. Resale is fantastic. You'll generally get almost all your money out of it. Out of it. Wow. Um, I was going to ask you about that. That's really interesting. Yeah, it, that, that's a unique thing with a yurt. Like if you build a house, you cannot take that house back down. And if you drop 300 grand into building oh, a house, yeah. you the only way you can get that money back is to sell the property it's sitting on. Um, if you spend $30,000 on a year and live in it for three years, given inflation and material costs going up, there's a good chance three, four years from now, you could turn around and sell that year for the same $30,000 that you paid for it. Wow. And that's a common thing. We, we, in fact, in fact, the, the inflation bout we've gone through, I've seen yurts for sale that were purchased a couple, three years ago that are selling for more than what they originally paid for them. Wow. Yeah, there's there's a lot of demand for yurts. They're very popular. And they really, they don't lose their value as fast as a lot of other things. And and uh, yeah, it, it's it's great. You can take them back down without damage, packing them back up. And, you know, it's still a house that people want. Are there any other really big pros to your there policy? Is. Taxes, that's an interesting one. A lot of times, you know, counties will tax you on the value of the structures on your property. For folks on a budget. 
some, some, some localities may see that as a temporary structure and may not tax it even as, as a house. You, you may avoid those taxes entirely. Others are just going to see that and, and value it um, correspondingly less. If you put up a yurt that's worth $50,000 instead of a house that's worth three hundred or 400 these days to build a you know, fairly, not even a very big house, you know, the value you're going to be taxed on is that much lower. You could be paying, you know, a fraction of, of those property value taxes because you're living in a year. So that, that could be hundreds or you know thousands of dollars extra per year in your pocket because you chose to do something um, uh, lower impact. That idea, the, the light footprint, that's a huge pro to me. And then you already mentioned this. I'll just enunciate it. You talked about them. While they may look to somebody who doesn't know any better, like a tent that got put up, uh, yeah. the strength and the flexibility of the structure. Our, our basic structure is, is good for 50 pounds of snow load per square foot wow. on the roof, but that could be, you know, several feet of snow. Most, most places the it's out of the box. It's already going to be enough. Yeah. Um, they're also rated for roughly a hundred miles an hour of wind, wow. which is a significant, significant wind storm. They do great in the wind because of the roundness and the fact that that outer, the entire outer structure is so smooth. Uh, they're, no eaves sticking out to grab the wind, much less of a downwind wall that can create that negative pressure bubble that rips your house apart in a hurricane. It does great against those kinds of forces. So, you know, it's part of part of what makes the yurt do so well with, with that amount of material that you have put in. This is somewhat specific to Alaska, but it, it applies also to anyone who's on a tight time frame. is that ability to raise your structure faster. And it's, it could be a fun event instead of a, um, uh, you know, a headache to figure out how to put your building up. You know, you said a weekend when we opened the show here. I'll put in a caveat. You can raise the yurt in a weekend if you've got your platform ready. The platform is a is an important piece of the project that usually is going to involve putting in some foundation posts and building out a beam and post structure with a with a with a round deck on top of it. That does take some more work. Better plan a better plan a couple more weekends for that at least. Uh, <laughs> that was called but, marketing what I was doing at the beginning there. False yeah, marketing, maybe. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can, you can, of course, people will work on that ahead of time and get yeah. it. You know, they can, they can putz on that and get it ready, and then yeah. your shows. Up. You know, it could be, and, and it can be uh, one of the cool things about a yurt is it can also be um, a real community building experience, like an old school barn raising. The nice thing about putting up a yurt is is more hands make it easier. Uh, they're not going to get in each other's way so much. If you tried to hire a bunch of rookies to come help you frame your house, you're going to go backwards. Yeah. Actually, plane. You know, each 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 time you need to cut a board and it's too short, uh, you can't cut it longer. So, but a yurt's going to come as a kit. Lots of hands makes it go up. You, you can you can get a big barbecue going, and before you know it, your yurt's up, and and people enjoy the experience. Not a thing that a lot of a lot of folks these days have an opportunity to like to do things with their hands. We're we're such an electronic society right now that to uh, be able to spend the weekend with friends uh, building something that you can look back on and remember that that and that that's just kind of a fun uh, a fun thing to be able to do with a year. Uh, any other th on the list of pros and cons, Paul? Any other things that stand out to you? I guess I should mention there's one more pro. <laughs> there's a few. Uh, you know, I, I think the ones I mentioned so far were mostly budget and kind of engineering based. There is another pro, and that's just the the connection with nature. That you get in a yurt that you don't get in a stick frame structure some people may put that down as a con uh i, I as i i see it as a pro you know hearing the wind and the rain you lose that connection with you know modern housing so you know being able to look up through that center skylight and see the stars or if you're lucky in alaska see the northern lights uh, right through the center of the top of your house is, is pretty neat too so um you know there's there's definitely some some emotional and you know livability aspects that are pretty neat about the year too what do you think so far? Does it sound like something you'd like to live in? Let us know in the comments below what are your thoughts on the yurt so far in this interview. Now we're about to cover a really big question. What about bears? And of course dive into all the other cons of the yurt. But before we do, if this video has answered some questions you had about a yurt and you would like more like this, hit that thumbs up button. It'll let us know this is something you like. We'll make more videos like this. Now, the cons of the yurt and bears. The, the single road, biggest roadblock, it, it's not necessarily a con of a yurt, it's a con with our uh, regulatory system and our banking system. So it's difficult to get financing for a yurt from a bank because they're non-traditional. 
there are some ways that people can can get financing. The, the single road, biggest roadblock, it, it's not necessarily a con of a yurt, it's a con with our uh, regulatory system and our banking system. So it's difficult to get financing for a yurt from a bank because they're non-traditional. There are some ways that people can, can get financing. The other con I mentioned was uh, the other end of regulatory stuff is permitting. Yurts can be a challenge to permit in some locations. In the city, you know, where your neighbors are all looking at you, that's probably the toughest one. You're not going to fly under the radar there. The inspector is going to want to come out and, and, and do code inspections. Modern uniform building code is going to require a certain amount of insulation R value. Yurts generally aren't going to hit that R value. They're going to be below that just due to the nature of their construction. It doesn't mean that they can't hold heat. You can't heat them. It just means that there's a there's a certain number that uh, the building industry wants you to hit. And if you can't do that, you're going to have trouble getting permits. So there's, there's that old saying that it's better to ask forgiveness. Than <laughs> and that can come into play too. Like, you know, we, we don't want to, we obviously don't want to encourage people to set up yurts where they're going to be a problem with yeah. neighbors and stuff. Yeah. It is a pain to have to take your yurt back down. The issue of the insulation, and that's something I did want to ask you in this con section. Um, yep. You know, there is less insulation. Now it's a smaller space to heat. But how do you find, how is a yurt to keep warm or to keep cool? How, yeah. how do they fare when it comes to regulating temperature? There, there is a difference there versus a regular house. So that, that temperature is going to be more variable. Um, if you've got the yurt warm, it's going to cool down faster. The insulation's thinner. You're going to have to run your heater more than you otherwise would. You know, I'll frequently tell people up in Alaska, and wood wood heat is very common up here for for folks. You know, instead of building, you know, instead of burning uh, three cords of wood over the winter, you're going to build, you're going to burn four. You know, instead of two cords, you might burn three or four because you're going to have to stoke that stove more frequently. So there's an expense there. You may end up spending, you know hundreds of extra dollars over the year in heat. And that's, that's not nothing. A lot of people will weigh, well, okay, I'm going to spend hundreds of dollars a year more in heat expenses, maybe even a thousand or more, but I'm going to weigh that against having saved $250,000 in construction costs or 350 or more. And they realize that, that it's a no brainer when they really think about the math, they would far rather do something that's has a lower input initial input like that and that they can main they can maintain you know those utility costs more easily uh, one sure. thing i've heard a lot of people ask about and talk about paul i want to ask you humidity in the yurt in the hot days in the yeah. summer humid days That's cool. is it harder to regulate any tips on how to handle that it can be, yeah, and it, it, that's going to be real lo location specific. The yurt gets a fair amount of airflow through it. It's generally not a super airtight structure. You want to you want to avoid a few things that that make things worse. Trying to tighten a yurt up too much can work against you in terms of not letting humidity escape. We as humans breathe out a lot of water vapor, take showers, let off a lot of vapor, cook. Again, all those things add water vapor to the air. So if you can get some airflow. Crack that top vent up there uh, to let air flow through the yurt and keep it a you know breathing structure that's gonna gonna help keep that humidity down. That's that's mostly it. Mostly it. We still have to talk about bears. But if up until this point you're interested in a yurt, Paul tells us how you can get a hold of Nomad Shelters. We have both a Facebook page and a website, of course, these days. Nomadshelter.com. Yeah, we, we've got a, a great build calculator on there. So you can go on and price out your yurt, choose your options, do, do quick comparisons about um, how big a yurt do I want? Um, what is it going to cost me to put in extra doors and windows and choose different insulation packages? So um, recommend that's a great place to start and then continue to get in contact with us through that website. I got to say that is a really fun place to start because you can literally build your own yurt, customize it and see how much it will cost in just a few minutes. So I'll have a link in the description of this podcast. You can go check out Nomad Shelter, their build calculator. Now we have to answer the question everybody asks. If I am living in a yurt, what about bears? I, I should throw out something that a lot of people bring up with me as, as a concern and they, they, they consider it a con. So I have this conversation with a lot of folks. Um, it comes up a lot and that is bears. <laughs> um, I have seen it all. I'm doing my research. Everybody asks about bears. <laughs>
Yeah. Lately, too, van- or vandalism, break-ins. Yeah. Um, human- bears are not the only mammal on the face of the planet that likes to break into buildings, yeah. unfortunately. Um, so yeah, so if one of those guys comes, decides to come along through the forest and find your yurt and you've left bacon on the counter, what I tell people in our, our experience um, from you know years of, years of talking to folks is um, a determined bear can break into your yurt um, the same way it's going to break into any cabin. They're going to go through the front door. They, it doesn't matter that it's a yurt. It's the, it's, it may as well be a, a 2,000 square foot house. They're going to walk up to the front door, put their paws on it and lean. And that's all it takes. Wow. So no difference in a yurt. It's the same thing. If you, you the, the moves there are the same as any other thing. Uh, reduce your food waste. Uh, don't leave scraps and garbage where they can get to it. Don't train the bear that this is a food source. You know, worst case scenario, they're going to, they're going to bust your door in and, and you'll have to, you'll have to clean that up. If, if you're in a really bad spot, then, then you'd want to invest in an electric air fence. They're very, very effective. Bears do not like to get zapped. Um, they'll, they're quick. They're, they're fast learners too. So, and I, I would guess the last caveat, this isn't, a, this isn't actually a con about the yurt, but it's a general comment about planning for your construction. This applies to any, any building construction is, is try to look at the total package price. When Paul says total package price, he means not just the building itself, also the foundation and all the infrastructure to get it up. There are nine things that you want to consider when deciding where to actually place your house or your yurt, and we covered those in another episode of our podcast. You're definitely going to want to watch that episode because if you get any of these wrong, it's going to cost you a lot more money to build your home. Click on the link that just popped up on your screen so you can learn what nine things to consider when choosing a location for your home. In the rest of this interview, Paul went on to describe how to build a yurt step by step. He included some great advice on the foundation that might save you money and be more flexible for your plans in the future. Homesteady Pioneers have access to the full length episode. We'll have a link below to that full length episode in the Pioneer Library.